today on Coding 101, how to create dynamic web pages with Pearl. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Lynda.com. Learn what you want when you want with access to over 2,400 high quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L Y N D A dot com slash C101. Welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we let you into the world of the Code Monkey. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I am Shannon Morris. And for the next 30 minutes, we are going to show you everything. Well, not everything, but pretty close to what you need to know all about Pearl. No, it's everything. No, it's, it's no. Every single Every, bit. It's all in this. All of it. Whatever. Compiled Just in this the episode. 30 minutes. No, it's totally, totally <laughs> not at all. Now, we've been uh, going through regular expressions, which thankfully we're, we're, we're not done with it in the sense that there's a lot more you can learn about regular expressions. But I think we're done with it for this module because we need to move on to other things. And yet, regex is something incredibly important, right, Shannon? That's right, it is. So today, I decided to start off with Snubs Compiled with a little review, just a little overview of the different regular expressions that we have learned. So first off, there were the ones that call, are called match uh, operators. Mm -hmm. And those ones include M, S, and T, R. So those stand for match, substitute. Substitute's the one that we've been using a ton of. And mm -hmm. then transliterate. And then there's also modifiers that go at the end. And those include G, I, M, O, S, X. And those stand for for global, case insensitive. We used both of those plenty of times. And then we also have, uh, there's the treat as multiple lines one, right. which is super, super handy, as well as treat as single line. There's also evaluate the line uh, only once. And you can also do one that is extended. That's the X. And that one's for any white yeah, space that you Yeah, whenever you, you want to recognize white space. Now, now, remember, the easiest way to remember regex is to, to cut it up into its four pieces. So if right. you've got that line, the first piece is going to give you the match operator. The second piece is going to give you the expression you're looking for. The third piece is if you decide to swap it or, or to substitute it, that's what you're going to substitute into its place. And then that fourth piece is all the modifiers that you can add. And just as you said, exactly. you get to choose exactly how you look for the string you're looking for. So those are regular expressions, and we're pretty much, well, hopefully we're done with those for a little while. Yeah, they're making my of brain course, hurt. They do come into play quite a bit, but I also wanted to share one of our viewership submissions as far as code goes from our Google Plus community, because that's growing, and we love you guys, and thank you so much for sharing your code. We haven't had a lot of Pearl ones lately, but we did get a really good one from Daryl, and this is over at... Dun, 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 dun. Wrong one. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so this is from Daryl Medley, and this is a vowel world word counter. So I'm going to click on his code right here. So it says enter any kind of sentence. So I'm going to say um, my favorite match operators include, um, let's see, substitute and match. Period. And then you hit enter, and it counts nice. all the vowels, all the words with vowels in them. So we have phi for A, Y, there's only one, which is my. And then down here, we also have it using a loop. Uh, and we pretty much get the same exact calculations out down at the bottom, too. And then just to enter out, you just hit enter, and it closes. So very, very simple. And I'll show you what the code looks like. There we go. OK, so he includes tons of comments for us, which of is course. extremely nice. And then we run down here. We have a little loop, a main loop. And this one just uh, just does yep. until enter There's is your pressed. standard input. Mm -hmm. And then we scroll down a little bit farther. 
And there are our wonderful regular expressions. There we go. So we have a ton of regex used in here. It's super, super handy. And I love the fact that he included so many in here because it totally works with what we, we've been talking about on the show. Mm -hmm. So very cool code. Thank you so much, Daryl, for sharing that. I also wanted to share mine too. Yes, please. So this involves what we learned from Patrick last week. So remember when he told us that you don't only have to use Perl in a notepad, you can also do it via the command line. Yeah, the, the, he called this the most important thing you will ever learn about programming. Exactly. And if he was wrong, he was going to give you one of his bunnies. Now, the internet <laughs> came out and said, hey, give me a bunny, because I don't, I think you're totally but bogus. I there you go, there's the bunny. But uh, it actually is very useful. It's very useful because it takes something that we would typically only use inside of our developer environment, exactly. and it, it makes it a command line function, which is kind of cool. I'd say it's close to one of the most important things <laughs> you'll ever learn, but I still think Patrick owes me a bunny. It is pretty cool, and yeah, I can definitely see how this could come in really handy, especially if you're working a lot and you need to use Perl code to search and replace things. So this is Perl Pi, as they call it. Uh, I discovered on my Windows computer, and I did some searching around on the internet, doesn't work exactly yeah, the same on Windows. Unfortunately. Surprisingly, we didn't get any uh, email feedback about this, but I did figure out that it doesn't work the same. So you'll put in, say, I'll put in my wildcard down here. And I tried this a series of ways before I decided to go search it on the Googles. And I had my colon right there. So it says can't find string terminator. So I changed it to that and then it wouldn't replace the um, the wildcard.txt. And I was like, what is going on? So it's a, apparently it's an Windows. issue with Windows it's because Windows. it's not Unix. It's Damn not it, like those nice Unix Stop programs. letting me down. So <laughs> instead of dealing with that and trying to fix it myself, I was like, well, screw this. I'm going to go into my VMware player and I'm going to do it via Kali Linux. So I just got into Kali Linux and I decided to do it here. So I ls into the and then CD'd into the desk, desktop. I have three text documents over on the desktop. Uh, best websites, and this is just a series of um, SDR websites for software defined radio. And then I have software defined radio uh, listed a couple of different times in these different documents. So I have that. I have Hack 5 episodes listed where I have tutorials, beginner, intermediate, stuff like that. And then know how episodes. Um, now, while you're looking for that, I will say that you can make this work in, in Windows. You just have to slightly change the, you do. the text. But don't learn it. The reason why we didn't show <laughs> it is because we don't want you to learn that because it doesn't work like that way that way on Linux it's a or pain Mac. In the butt. It's a little bit of a pain in the butt. It is. So, yeah. I'm, so I have my three note, notepad documents in here, and they all have software-defined radio spelled out in each one. I want to change that to just say SDR. So what I will do is write out Perl dash PI, Perl dash PI, mm -hmm. TAC E, or dash E, and then I have S for substitute, uh, slash software defined radio. So it's looking for this string of text, that right. software defined radio, slash SDR, and it's gonna replace software defined radio with SDR, slash G for global, and that that whole command, and then you just do wildcard.txt yeah, so to look for any that has txt a text, documents uh, a on tag. my desktop. Nice. So when I hit enter, doesn't say anything in here, but if I go into, say, best websites, you'll notice that up here it said software defined radio, now it says SDR. Uh, this one did not change because there's no spaces between software defined and radio, but it did change again down here. SDR is cool. Yay, SDR. And then same thing happened with my Hack 5 episodes. So these all changed to SDR for tutorial and all that stuff. So it works. It totally works in my Kali Linux machine. Not so much in Windows. Still kind of sulking that it doesn't work right in Windows. Stupid Mah, Windows. Stupid Windows. <laughs> Yes, okay. So we so we found something that uh, Windows doesn't do, but it does everything else excellently. So no hate mail, please. Super super fun. All right, all right. Now, uh, before we actually get to the ad, you you included something in the doc on the lighter side of programming. <laughs> I really kind of like this. You want to explain to the <laughs> folks what this so is? This is so funny. So, first off, I found this I uh, I believe it's X XKCD. Uh, this is a cute little comic that one of our one of our followers decided to post. This is from Nick's Craft, and it says, <laughs> if you're having Perl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, so I use regular expressions. Now I have 100 problems. 
<laughs> and, and this, yeah, it's if if you talk to experienced pro, pro programmers, there's a little bit of love hate. They understand <laughs> it can be kind of confusing, but no, really, seriously, it's it's a very useful tool to have. You, you know what else is a useful tool to have? What's that? Oh, I'm just thinking uh, maybe someplace online where I could learn Ooh. stuff. Oh, oh, yeah, because I got a big old knowledge hole and I need stuff poured. I, you know, into that hole. I, I know a place like that where you can learn all sorts of things from different tutorials that people have made and their videos are super professional and they look good. I like that. That's the kind of knowledge I need in this hole. That's right. It's called lynda.com. Right. You heard of it? I, I heard. <laughs> so lynda.com helps you learn and keep up to date with everything that you need to know about your software. You can pick up brand new skills. You can do anything that you want and you can explore new hobbies with their easy to follow video tutorials. So whether you want to master the fundamentals of programming, you want to learn new programming languages like Python or Perl, or you want to develop and design engaging websites, lynda.com offers thousands of courses in a variety of topics. lynda.com released a new iPhone and an iPad app for iOS 7 and enhanced their Android app to provide Chromecast support. This is so cool. Chromecast support, that's awesome. And the iOS app includes a more visual intuitive interface and both new apps offer offline courses and video viewing, so you don't have to be connected to the internet to be able to use your lynda.com account. This makes it easy and convenient to learn even in environments without internet access. So you could totally learn while you're camping. That's amazing. Lynda.com uses... Uh, it would seem <laughs> that RTD has some sort of fetish circling around GoPro. Yeah, it's so strange. I don't know, what that I don't know is. man. Mm, we were talking about <laughs> programming a little earlier and maybe some we key running. But so we can definitely go over, over there. You can check out how to ride a motorcycle, or you can go and search for creating coupons. That's what we learn. want. Thank you. So say you have a website, you have an e-commerce site, and you want to draw in more customers to your site to buy your t-shirts or buy your tech. You can go to this site, you can go to lynda.com, and you can learn how to create e-coupons for people to use. And they'll show you how to create expiration dates and how to do multiple coupon uses and things like that so people can't use multiple coupons in one take. It's really, really cool. Lynda.com offer, also offers users a, a seamless way between mobile and desktop applications to be able to view courses wherever they want. And new courses include C Essential Training, simple Android development tools, Photoshop CC for photographers, intermediate, so if you're new to it, you can definitely jump in. They have 2,400 courses, more are added every single week. Lynda.com courses are produced at the highest quality, not like the homemade videos on YouTube that you sometimes see. Lynda.com works with software companies to provide you updated training the same day. New versions hit the market, so you'll always have the very latest skills. And instructors are accomplished professionals at the top, top of their fields. They're passionate about teaching. They have beginner, intermediate, and advanced courses for everybody. You can watch from your computer, tablet, mobile device. So whether you got 15 minutes or you got 15 hours, each course is structured. So you can learn from start to finish. You can also search the transcripts, which is super cool. So you can find quick answers or you can read along with the video if you prefer to read. Also, lynda.com offers certificates of completion when you finish a course. So you can publish that on your LinkedIn profile and get yourself a really nice job. It's only 25 bucks a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library or 37.50 a month. You can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project. So you can use the exact same project assets that they do, which makes life very easy for if you're following along with a tutorial. And you can try lynda.com Right now, with a free seven-day trial, visit lynda.com slash c101 to access the entire library. That's 2,400 courses free for seven days. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash c101. I love lynda.com, and you should too. Yeah, we thank They're them very, for our very useful, and we thank them. Yes, thank you. You know, one of the things I, I actually do like about Linda is the fact that we were showing uh, examples that were not tech related. It's a, you know, about the GoPro, about couponing. So it really does contain a nice breadth of knowledge. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's not yeah. just the depth. It's, there's a lot of stuff there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of a lot of stuff there, uh, in our ivory tower today, we want to pull away from the, some of the things we've been doing in the, the first couple of episodes of oh, the boy. Pearl module. We want to talk about web pages, specifically about dynamically generated web pages. Uh, now, Stumps, when you think about the most basic of web pages, what do you think is in there? It's it's yeah. I think of an HTML file 
from GeoCities when I was 15 years old and wanted to host my own anime gallery. Exactly. And that's that's how we wrote the very <laughs> first web pages, right? They were all static. So we had uh, yeah. the HTML tag, the body tag, closed tags at the bottom, and then and everything it. in the middle is what you saw. And no matter where you go or what computer you were on, it it was always the same. It would always be the same information. It would always be formatted the same. Yep. And that's what we learned when we designed static web pages. Mm -hmm. You put a little bit of text, maybe a couple of images. We didn't really have video links back then because it took no. up way we too much bandwidth. Animated GIFs. We had bandwidth. Under yeah. construction. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> but that's the most basic kind of web page, right. which you can still do. That still has a place if, if you're just creating like some sort of informational page yes. with, with data that's never going to change. But that's very, very minimal, right? We don't really do that it's a lot. very, and, very rare. And it looks ugly. Yeah, that's yeah, true. It's, it's not great. <laughs> so, so what we've transferred over to is we've transferred over to dynamically generated web pages. We don't have static text that never changes, uh -huh. but we rely on some sort of process, uh, and we're going to talk about the possible processes, to generate the code, generate the way the page looks based on settings that we've given it. Like we wanted to use this template, and we want it to be this wide, and we want it to hold these pictures and this text. That's the sort of web that we've come to expect. Yeah, we definitely have. I mean, that's, that's all that you see nowadays is dynamic websites. Right, yeah. And, and think about, it. I mean, for example, uh, I know a lot of people are still using WordPress. Actually, not still. I still use WordPress. That's a dynamically generated content database. Uh, it, it, and the easiest way to picture that is when you write your blog posts, right. you can change the way the page looks without changing the text, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I, let's say I've got my, my blog post and I go, I don't like the way the lookout is. I go to the settings of my WordPress blog and I go, I want to use this template. And right. it will change the, the style, it will change the pictures, it will change the colors, it may even change the order of the text, but I don't have to rewrite that. I don't have to go yeah, back exactly. in over each and every single page and, uh, and change. You don't even have to like copy and paste your body of text into the new theme. Yeah. It just does it for you. It just does it for you because that's how it, it is when you dynamically generate ah. your pages. Now, uh, imagine when, when I was first starting and we didn't have any of those technologies. There was, there was nothing that could dynamically generate a page easily. If you designed a page and then you decided that you wanted to make a change to the format, and let's say your page, your your site was a thousand pages. You'd have to go into each and every single one of those pages and change the element Ugh. that you want. Yeah, it was no thank you. No, no, not good. So we don't do that anymore. We thank goodness we're we're done with it. Now, when we talk about dynamically generating web pages, there's two ways to do it. There's client side and there's server side. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I've dealt with a little bit of that in some hacking tutorials I've done, but... Yeah, yeah well, especially in the hacking tutorials, <laughs> because we're talking about scripting languages, and yes. a lot of exploits will take advantage of these, these scripting, especially scripting on client side. Now... So what are client and server for anybody that doesn't know? Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about that. When we talk about client side, it's, it's just like the name might imply. The processing, the interpreting happens on the client side, so that's on your computer. Okay. So, for example, when you go to my web page and I want it to have a certain menu and there has to be a little bit of animation, I'm going to write it in scripting, now, but I'm going to write it in scripting that will be executed on your computer. Your browser will interpret all of that as it's also loading up the HTML for the page and it will give you what you see. So that's all happening on my client. That's all happening on the client side. Now the languages that people have for client side scripting would include things like JavaScript, which I know gets a bad rap, which includes Ajax, which is which is with JavaScript, uh, things like ActionScript, which is used for you, uh, Adobe Flash, uh, oh. yeah, and uh, uh, Dart, VBScript, <laughs> TypeScript. Those are all client-side scripting languages. Uh, now, the way you can tell most easily is, uh, unless they've done something weird because they want to obfuscate their scripting code, they will include, developers will include the code in the main page that loads. So in your browser, you know how you can go to like file and view code? Yes, if, view source. <laughs> view source, right. And this is actually, this is a great way to play with scripting languages. Mm -hmm. If you find something that you like, if it's a client side script, you can get it because oh, wow. it's on your browser. So you can go ahead and find out how they did it, take that, put it into your program, and then play with the parameters to see, well, how does this thing work? In fact, we've got people in the chat room who are saying, you know, sadly, sometimes when I when I want to do something, I just go to Google and I find a script and I copy and paste. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what I used to do when I was making my anime websites back exactly, then. Exactly, right? You go, oh, that's so cool. Okay, well, 
what yep. how in the process of copying and pasting and then making it work for your page you will learn how it works that's a great way to learn no shame in that it's so true yeah yeah exactly and so there he goes you, he's gonna wait you want to go view source uh, there you go. View so, source. Then this is what you see. So any, th see, you see the scripting. Oh, eh, we're gonna get kind of crazy here. You, nah, <laughs> no, let's turn that off. You're, I'm getting a headache. Yeah. So come on back. Now, when we talk about uh, client side, just remember that everything is happening in your browser. So a lot of it is going to be dependent on the browser you're using, right. the computer you're using, the amount of processing power that you have. That's something that would you explain have to why kind of sometimes if I go to a computer that's not, or if I go to a web website that's not set up correctly, and I have a certain browser extension or a plugin that doesn't work right, when it gets to my browser, it doesn't work so well. Yeah, and that's why sometimes uh, when, uh, like, let's say you have something in in Firefox, mm -hmm. and it won't work in Chrome. Or you have something in Chrome, but it won't work in IE. Or you have something in IE, but it doesn't work in the other two. And if it, you email tech support, they say, well, what browser what version browser are you, are you Do you yeah. have any extensions on right mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's why. Not ask. always, because you also can have uh, compatibility, compatibility issues with server-side plugins oh, really? on certain browsers. Just, just the way that they work. It, it gets kind of sloppy. Oh. But most of the time, Whenever they say, what browser are you using, it's because they're running some kind of, of client-side script that doesn't play nicely. Got it. Yeah. For example, there's this, uh, oh, I, I should show this. Actually, this is, this, this is a good reason uh, why you should have uh, the, uh, my computer up. Let's see if I can go to this map that IP Viking. That comes. Let's see if that comes up. <laughs> this is something that I've been playing with. This is a fantastic map that shows you attacks around the world. So this is real-time oh, information awesome. from the IP Viking network. They've got the honeypots all around the world that let you see what country is attacking what country, what the targets are. It even lets you see the IPs that are initiating the attacks and what IPs they're headed for. It's, That's so cool. I, I had this thing on all July Fourth weekend, and I just had. I mean, it's it's kind of mesmerizing. You just watch it go. Wow, what's China doing right now? Or who's firing awesome. at me? Uh, now, this only works in Chrome. Now, a lot of this does happen on the server side, but this is this is a very heavy on JavaScript, mm -hmm. which is the a client side, browser side, your computer side initiated. Which means, if you have a slow, crappy computer, ah. it's not going to look very good. Yeah, that does yeah. make sense. So, there you go. So that that gives you a clear indication of what the difference is between server side and browser side. Okay. All right, now we've got the client side. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the server side. Yes. Just like uh, client side, of course, dealt with the client, server side means that all of the interpretation, all the generation of the page is happening on the server side. So that's like whoever built the website, their server that they saved all that code on. It, it generates, it dynamically generates your code. So it, it will be using a language, like some of the more popular server side scripting languages uh, would be things like, uh, oh, hold on, let me get back in Python. Uh, would be Python, <laughs> would be PHP, would be oh, ASP.NET, yeah. it would be Perl, Ruby, uh, Java, or JavaScript. There actually is a server side JavaScript that can run. Uh -huh. uh, Fusion, do you remember Cold Fusion? No. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. I, feel, I don't think I, I ever use that. <laughs> I feel old. But that means that all of the pages are dynamically generated on the server side before they're sent to the client. Okay. Now, the advantage of that is you don't, you're not as dependent on the, uh, on the client computer. So if the client has a really jank computer or busted browser, as long as it can understand uh, HTML or XHTML, mm -hmm. it's going to be able to understand what you're sending it. Uh, uh -huh. it, on the other side, however, uh, client side, some people really like using client side computing because uh, it it gives you a bit more control over the individual's computer. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So there's there are advantages, there are pros and cons to using client side or server side. But what you what you most need to know is that most of the advanced web pages that you might visit probably use a mixture of both. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you need to know a little bit of client side. You need to know a little bit of server side. Okay. Uh, because each of them has a strength and each of them has a weakness. So what does all of this have to do with Perl? All of what this has to do with Perl is that Perl is an absolutely fantastic server-side scripting language. Really? Uh, we who use it here at Twit to dynamically generate a page that will be sent out to individuals. In fact, uh, one of the, the people that we have who is most responsible for doing that is our code warrior, who I think <gasps> maybe we should we should bring into the show. Ladies and gentlemen, it's it's Mr. Patrick Delahanty, who is not just our code warrior, but who is the code warrior 
for Twit TV. Patrick, thank you for coming back on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Glad to be here. Now, uh, we were just talking a little bit about dynamically generated web pages, and that's what you do, right? I mean, could, could you imagine creating a static page in today's uh, era? Uh, that, that'd be impossible for what we have to do. Yeah, yeah. We, we just wouldn't do it. I mean, unless you were just doing a practical joke. Now, can you tell us a little bit how server-side scripting works here at Twit? Uh, well, actually, most of the server-side stuff we've got here is in PHP, not Perl. Right. Uh, but I do have a few Perl scripts behind the scenes. Uh, but for uh, in terms of Perl, uh, I use it on my animecons.com site to read the database and then present the data on a page without having to make a page for every possible data combination. Oh, that makes sense, because that would yeah. take hours. <laughs> yep. yeah. Now, let me ask you this, because we, we're starting to get a little bit of discussion in the chat room. People always have their favorite scripting language. So we got some people saying, oh, no, it's PHP. Some are saying Perl. Some are saying ASP. We've got someone who wants Ruby. Uh, how do you choose which server-side scripting language you're, you're going to choose? Uh, it probably just depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, if you want to uh, parse some input using regular expressions, Perl is probably going to help you out if you need to script on the back end. Uh, but if you change a lot of data inside the page, maybe PHP would be an option. Uh, and also, just what you're familiar with is usually a good one to go with. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Why don't you show us how we're going to use Perl to dynamically generate a web page? Okay. Uh, well, First, before you can even dynamically generate the web page, you need the web server set up. Uh, and that's a whole other thing. That, I mean, this isn't server administration 101. Uh, so what I did was uh, last, or last week I downloaded MAMP and put that on my Mac. And now I've got a web server running on my Mac. It's an Apache server. It also installed a MySQL server. Uh, I can run... Uh, PHP or Python or Perl with this, and it's uh, they do have a version for Windows that's in beta. But you know, there's other server options for Windows if you want to use that. Windows. Uh, so it, this only took a minute or two to set up. It was very easy, uh, and so then I got it running, and I have all my directory. I have all my files in a directory here. So under MAMP, I've got a CGI bin directory. That's where I put my my uh, your scripts, my Perl scripts, yep. and then I made C101 just to have it nice and organized. And so I've got four example scripts here that we can go through. Now it, it is interesting to note. We should we should probably point this out that uh, we're, we're heading into a little uncharted territory because previously when we were running Perl code, we were doing it on our computers, and we were assuming that we were going to like create a program that someone would download, put on their computer, and run. We're now starting to talk about things that you would do not on your computer. You would have these scripts on a server that people would be accessing or that they'd be getting a web page from. It's, it's, you have to change your thinking because you're not executing it here, you're executing it remotely or the server is actually executing it for you. Right, and uh, so I've got this local on my Mac with this MAMP server and MAMP is just one of many options for a web server. Uh, but I could just as easily put it up on a Linux server that I have hosted on DreamHost where I have all my sites. Or uh, if it's another script, I could put it on the Twit server and have it there. And it doesn't have to be on my local machine. I'm just doing that for this example. And so uh, other people outside the network can't necessarily get into my machine because of firewalls, but I can at least run it here and test it and show right. everybody. Yeah. So your computer is basically acting like a server for you. Yeah, I've That's got it set up as my own little server. All right, show us in. All right, uh, so I've got this first script, which it's Hello World. All it does, if I zoom <laughs> in over here, because it's really tiny, it says Hello World. <laughs> That's it. And so we'll look at the code for that script, and this is, we'll walk through this. Uh, so I've got the, uh, I tell, uh, tell it where Perl is, and I, you don't have to do this on Windows apparently, but on most environments you do have to say where Perl is. I even do it on Windows just to be sure. Uh, and then I start out by just setting the content type for the page. So what I do is I print content type, colon, with a space, text slash ASCII. So I'm just telling the web server that it's presenting ASCII text. And then I do two new lines, one to go two. in the new line, and then one is a blank. Oh. 
And then I'm free to do whatever. To yeah, you have to you have to do two. If you only do one, it won't work. You okay. can do three, and it'll just print a blank line before your content. Um, and then I move on, and I do whatever scripting I want. So all I've done here is I print Hello World, and That's that it. gives me the Hello World web page. Right. And, and now I know there's going to be people who are, who are going to be saying, wait a minute, I could just write an HTML page, HTML open tag, body open tag, Hello World, close tags, and be done. Why yeah. would I do it this way? But what we, what you're trying to show is the very basics of creating a page that could use the code that we've been playing with the last four weeks to dynamically generate something that the user will see on screen. Uh, Patrick, do you have an example of that? Uh, I do, but I want to give another example first. Uh, so, well, first, to run this, I just went to the, the URL up here. Uh, my local host, Brian, if you could zoom in. There we go. Local host, CGI bin. C101 and app 25 demo one. And that's just where my file is located. And so that's the URL of my page. Uh, because it's localhost, you guys can't get to it outside. It's just my own local one. Right. Uh, my second script, it's hello world, but it's a little different because. Oh, yeah, you say change the text. What I did was I told it, I've got the same setup here with the content type, but this one is text slash HTML. So I'm telling it this is HTML content. It's not ASCII text. Right. Okay. So and which means it will now understand HTML tags. Yes. And so now I have print the HTML in text, which does the print with with the less than less than EOF, which prints everything until it gets to EOF. So here I'm just pre printing out this HTML. So if you view the source of this page. We'll see. It'll be the exact same thing. Yeah, it, oh, cool. it's exactly what I printed. So you change the font size by putting in the five, and this is all HTML for anybody yeah, who's this is, played with it. This is the basic HTML. Yeah. Right. But Easy. because he, he changed the mode to HTML, Perl knew that when this, this file was called, it, what, what it would do is it would push out HTML tags so that the browser would be able to understand it. Exactly. Now, if you had just changed the slash HTML to slash ASCII in your code, would it end up printing out the greater than HTML slash? Well, let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, you know, people are asking, so where is that being printed to? Where is that coming from? It's all coming from the script. So what the script is doing is it's generating HTML code. That code does not exist until the script runs. Uh -huh. When that script runs, it sends it to the browser. That's what the browser actually reads, which is nice. OK. Yeah, so we can look at my script here. And uh, so I've changed it to slash ASCII, and let's go back here. I'll reload the page. Oh, it prints oh, it out. Does. Yeah, because because <laughs> because uh, since you didn't tell it that it was a HTML file, Perl said, "Okay, I'm just going to send this as text," which <laughs> means yeah. the browser didn't have the the proper thing to interpret. It thought it should just print all this stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen a website do that before. <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now we'll go on to the third example. In this one. I have here are numbers from one to ten, wow. and it has numbers one to ten. Is that no, the most thrilling thing you've ever seen? Totally. Right. Now that doesn't look like ASCII either. Uh, no, that I did that as HTML, okay. and I could have done it as ASCII, but I chose HTML. And so, looking at this script, now you start seeing it because nowhere here did he write Ooh. an HTML file that said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's yeah. now he's using, using Perl code. He's using Perl code, exactly. So, so I now you see why this is popular. One to a hundred. Uh, I should change that too. There. And now we'll reload the page. Oh, wow. And, and now I've got <laughs> numbers all the way down to a hundred. That's cool. Which, there we go. Okay. And again, this is being dynamically generated. That file does not exist until the script is run and the server generates it and sends it to the browser. Okay. Yeah, and so this is just one example of a script. I mean, you could have anything come in here and do whatever dynamic thing it needs to do and then print it out. Uh, I just did printing numbers because it's pretty easy to understand. Yeah, yeah. That's now, really cool. Uh, Patrick, you know, okay, obviously... 
hopefully people at home are starting to see why this is useful, right? Yeah. Because when I want to create a web page for someone, I don't have, just like when I wanted to print something on my screen, I didn't want it to write everything that goes on screen. Yes. I could use a couple of loops, I could use a couple of yeah. if-then statements to dynamically change what I see. This means I can use those exact same methods, that exact same way of thinking, to dynamically generate a web page that someone will see over the internet. There's no application they have to download. They just run it and their browser sees it. That's really cool. But I know the question people are going to be asking is, is that all I can do? Is I oh, just yeah. print stuff? I mean, is that is that all Perl is good for? Can I, I do like backgrounds and images? Can and I be, like yeah, that? can I import different kinds of text? Can I Ooh. can I reach into a database and maybe pull links from videos ah. on YouTube? Pa Patrick, how how would that work? Well, I mean, you could call APIs like to Twitter or to YouTube and this whole other systems out there that you can get and send information to. Similar to Python. Yeah, and that's a, a way beyond coding 101, but uh, there's a whole interface and you can just use all that data and make your own. You can interface with a MySQL database and send those commands. Right. Um, yeah, it's a, oh, this is the start of a whole new world of being able yeah. to present the information on a web page. Now, 8-Bit Steve... Here we go. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Just don't start singing that. Do you want to write a program? Okay. Make no, sure we've got. Compiles just for you. <laughs> we've got we've got uh, eight bit Steve in the chat room who's saying so the loop is executed on the server. Yes, because it's a server side script. Now, Patrick, if you could go back to your example of counting to one hundred, if you could go and show them the page, go ahead and so not the code, but show them the source. So this is oh, what okay. the browser is seeing. Notice all the browser sees is HTML code to go ahead and print oh, those wow. numbers. It's not seeing any code to execute the program. That's the difference. If this was a client-side script, you would see the script generating the numbers. Because it's a server-side script, because it's being done on the opposite side of the connection, all you see is the result. This is the difference between client-side and server-side scripting. That's so cool. Yeah, nice. This, and so this this is this is one of the things that you're going to see anytime we start talking about actual dynamic web pages because yeah. obviously you don't just want to write programs that loop numbers and you know make things <laughs> walk. no you you want to call from from useful information right. and you can do that if you use a dynamically generated web page because you could do something like for example uh, let, let's say you have a, a, a calendar. And someone can click on a calendar number, and then it will query your database that holds all your calendar information, and it will say, give me all appointments between 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock mm -hmm. on this date. And then it just dynamically prints it. Oh, that so page cool. does not exist until you call that script. And that script executes on the server side, which means the browser, the client browser, your browser, will only receive the finished HTML code. So basically, you're just going to you're going to call that script whenever you click on that link, whenever you open yeah. the website. Yeah, but but before that, that page doesn't exist. That's the dynamically created web page. It's it's not so it's not cool. hidden somewhere. There is no link to that script to that page because that page doesn't exist until the script creates it. Now I want to make a website. Exactly, and now <laughs> you now you know how it works. Now all of the the server side scripting programs are going to uh, languages are going to work pretty much the same. And again, as Patrick explained, it depends on what you want to make. Uh, right. If you want to do regular expressions and, and that kind of deep database querying, Perl is a great language to use. But we use mostly PHP, and, and PHP is a really good wa language for making rich content on the web. Patrick, is there something else that they should know about scripting before they go off and try it on their own? Yeah, I've got one more thing. Uh, now that you're on a web server, you have access to some environment variables. And so this fourth one, this fourth example I have, I've got some crazy HTML formatting here, and this displays some of the variables that you can use. So here I've got uh, my server name, which it knows is localhost. If I was hosting this on twit.tv, it would say twit.tv. Uh, the server port. Port A. Uh, Woohoo! Yeah. Uh, the, which, if you watched Know How this week, you talked about the ports. Yes, yeah, we did. Uh, the document root. This is actually where on the machine my files are located. Ma so this is where the web server is. Uh, the user agent. This tells me, oh, I'm using, uh, it says Mozilla 5, but it, over here it says Chrome. And it tells me I'm on a Mac, that I'm running uh, Mac OS 10, 10.9.3. Uh, so I can get all the information from here. Uh, the script name that I'm actually running, so it knows what it is itself. 
And then down here it has uh, request method, get, and query string, which is empty right now. Hmm. And those are important for next week. Oh, but, you're teasing. Yeah, but I can show you the script behind here. Uh, so I've got... What? Okay, so I'll, I'll step through this here. HTML text. Yeah, I set it as HTML. And then I s set some headers. I just do a head tag, title tag. This is all just HTML. And here I'm printing the environment server name. Oh. So in the title of the page, if you look up here, it says local hosts environment. Oh. And so on my HTML title, I've got environment server names environment. Uh, so that's just the title. And then I do a body tag, font. Uh, and then I say the same thing for the title of the page. Uh, but then I do, I set an array with the variables that I want to display. And then I just, for each of these variables, print the name of the variable and then it, the value, the environment, and we do the variable name. So you didn't have to put any specific information about your computer into the code. You're just doing this environment tag. Yeah, it's pulling all of this information from the web server itself That's to know cool. what script right. it's running, what browser I'm using. And a, a quick note about server-side languages, server-side scripting languages. Uh, we're getting this question in the chat room. Thanks again for, for all your input in there, irc.twit.tv. Uh, people are saying, so wait, so the server just automatically understands Perl? No, it doesn't. It, a scripting language, just like any other language, needs to be installed on either the client or the server that it's going to be uh, interpreted on. So if you want to use Perl on your server, if you want that to be a server-side scripting language, you have to install Perl on your, on your server. If you want to use PHP, same thing. In fact, all the scripting languages, you need to put that module so that when that yeah. link is called, when that page, that, that file is called, the server knows how to deal with it. Uh, very simple to do, but, but again, remember, all the computing, all the processing, all the interpreting takes place on the server side. The only thing the client gets, that your browser gets, is the finished product, the HTML file that you need to see. Yeah, and most uh, hosts out there will support Perl and PHP and Python. They've already got it installed for their customers. Uh, so if you choose a web host, definitely make sure that it supports the language you need. Right, and, and actually, yeah, most web hosts today will, will have automatically Perl, uh, PHP, uh, at Ruby, not so much. I think you have to request Sometimes. Ruby. It, yeah. it's, I don't haven't I haven't found a whole lot of hosts that make that a standard thing. But uh, yeah, it, unless unless you are actually creating your own server that you're going to either host on your network or in a co-location, you don't have to install per se. Normally, your hosting agency will. Yes, Patrick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. That's Patrick Delahanty. He's uh, he's our code warrior here at twit.tv. We want to thank you again for being on the show. Do you want to tell the folks where they can find you when you're not coding? Uh, this week they can find me at chibiproject.com. It's a podcast where we destroy toys for fun. No. And I've been doing it for, I think, eight years now. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> he Don't. destroyed a Sailor Chibi. Movie. No. Yeah, that's how Shannon and I what met. What did you that's do? How you met. I was so sad. I saw it happen, and yeah. I was like, what are you doing? Brian Brush would breathe fire on the Sailor Myers doll, oh, and it's bad, Shannon man. was bad. so sad. Bad not man. happy. Bad <laughs> man. Well, we'll have you on next time to talk a little. You, you just teased a little bit of what we're going to be playing with. Yeah. Uh, more dynamically generated web pages. We're going to get you into this. We're going to show you exactly how it works so you can make something beautiful. What should we ask the audience to do this week? That's a good question. I think what you what we need to do is most of you, I, I'm almost positive that most of you have some way to host something, or yes? I'm sure most of you have, have either a web server that you're already playing with, or uh, perhaps uh, you, you've been having one that you've been wanting to play with, something with like a free introductory offer. Well, this is the time to do it. Go ahead and create some Perl scripts, drop it onto your web server, get it working, and then send us the links in our G Plus group. We'll, we'll, I mean, now that we can we actually... we always just view the source. We could just view the source. Yeah, go ahead and make sure that it's in there so we understand that you're out there, you're loud, you're proud, and you're making Perl server-side scripts. Ooh, fun. I love it. Ooh. Now, I know this is a lot of information. This is always a lot of information. So, Shannon, where do they go if they uh, are a little lost and they want to find some step-by-step? Twit dot tv slash code or slash code one yeah. so code, or coding yeah, yeah twin coding one yeah go there
Yeah. What, what you'll find is you'll find all of our episodes. Now, again, we are still, I, I have to make this disclaimer, we're still looking for a much better way to host all of our show notes because this kind of breaks a lot of, of coding format. So we've been using a GitHub, uh, a link to the GitHub. Actually, th that one doesn't contain the link to the GitHub. It's oh, there right it, there. Yeah, there it is. So that you can get over there and get our code. Now, the code is what you actually want. That's the stuff that you can download onto your computer and, and follow along with each and every single episode. So go ahead and go to, to twit.tv slash twitcoding101 and, uh, and go ahead and find us. Now, we've also got a G plus community, right, Shannon? That's right, we do. It's plus.google.com slash twitcoding101. You can go over there and join the 1,200 people that we already have in there and share your comments, share your questions. There's a lot of information going on back and forth in there. Yeah. Everybody's very helpful, and I love that community. Yes, I do. It's, it's a, a lot of really fun people. Also, you can uh, follow us live. Did you know we actually do this show? Oh, we're here. <gasps> I know. Weird, right? So weird. Yeah, every Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Pacific, you're going to find us at live.twit.tv. <laughs> you get to see the pre-show, the post-show, any of the, the all bloopers. The yeah, the, all the Yeah, all the sweetness. Yeah. Uh, also, if you're going to be here, we have a chat room. We do. Right? It's over at irc.twit.tv. And you can join in, and you can ask us questions during the live show, and we will answer them. We, we look for questions whenever we're doing the live show, so definitely join in. Hey, Stubbs. Hey, what? Uh, you know, there's this thing that we're both going to be doing sometime <gasps> in August. Is this, is this the reason why we're pre-recording at the end of I, July? I think it might be. It might be what yeah. we need to pre-record. Uh, what are we doing again? I forget. DEF CON! What the we're super excited. Both of us are going to DEF CON for our, our own things, but we're just going to happen to be there. Uh, DEF CON is the largest hacker conference in the United States. It's over in Las Vegas, and it's from August 7th through the 10th. If you guys are planning to go, uh, definitely join us in on the fun. I think it's like 200 bucks at the door. They don't do pre-registration. Nope. But there's even a lot of fun stuff happening in the casino at the Rio oh, yeah. if you don't want to actually go to the convention itself. Yeah. It, you don't it, have to be a hacker to go. Just have some kind of techie interest. They have like a lock picking village. They have a gamer village. The hardware hacking village. Hardware That's hacking my awesome. favorite. I love that place. I will be spending most of my time in the vendor area with my booth, uh, which will be super fun. It's a big surprise. Uh, no, With now, five, yeah. now uh, I know there's a lot of people out there who they kind of freak out every time we mention DEF CON because they're like, well, I'm not super elite hacker. You, you don't, don't have to be. No. I'm not. If you're a noob, if you know nothing about security, you know nothing about programming, DEF CON is still a really good place to, that's, go, because, that's place to go because, yeah, because there's a lot of experts who love sitting down with, with newbies and say, yeah. look, Let's get you started. You want to you want to learn how to lockpick? Here, let me show you what it looks like. Here's the tools that you're going to need. Yes. You want to learn how to solder something? Sure, go to the Hardware Hacking Village. And That's Smitty, true. who's been on our, our show Smitty's Know How, awesome. he's <laughs> awesome. He'll show you the right way to do it so you start off the right way. And, yeah, if you want to check out some of the security uh, uh, talks, that's always a good place to, yes. to get an ear on uh, what's happening in the community. I have never been to a DEF CON talk, but it's really fun to meet everybody yeah. who's going there because oh, you, you get to talk to the experts in their league. Yeah. By the way, don't miss Hacker, Je Hacker Jeopardy. Oh, yes. Seriously, you <laughs> to, I can't explain it because it's very not safe for work, but definitely go there. Oh, so fun. Uh, oh, now, until next time. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Father Robert Ballas here. End of line. <laughs> Standard out. Do you want to end a program? Do you want to end a program? Are you writing it in? Chinese.